so thanks very much. I'm going to talk today about uh, paleoclimate, my field of research. Um, and I'd encourage anyone interested in this field to check out this kind of wonderful series of tweets by uh, the current chair of the IPCC report, where she discusses the way that insights from paleoclimate have been integrated throughout the IPCC's work. Okay. So when the University of St. Andrews was founded in 1413, CO2 was at a level of 280 ppm in the atmosphere. Levels similar to 280 had in fact typified most of human history as we tend to think of it. 280 ppm was about the level of CO2 when the pyramids were built in the Great Wall of China. But 280 was also the level of CO2 when a Scotsman, James Watt, invented his steam engine in 1776, a device that takes the most carbon-rich rocks on the planet and converts them directly into atmospheric CO2. By the time I was born in 1985, CO2 had reached a level of 345 ppm. By the time I started university in 2003, CO2 was seven, uh, three, 175 ppm, and here today in 2022, uh, we're at 416 ppm. And this begs the question, what does a world with CO2 of 416 ppm look like? And what will future worlds with potentially even higher CO2 levels look like too? To address these questions, there's two main approaches that climate scientists can take. One is to use uh, computer models, climate models, encapsulations of what we know about Earth's climate system on a computer, ramp up CO2 and run them forward in time. The other complementary way to look at high CO2 worlds is to wind the clock back through the geological history of climate and see what we can learn from Earth's past climate history that can inform our present and indeed our future. So our first trip on this climate time machine is going to take us back 20,000 years or so to the peak of the last ice age. This is an image of uh, what that would have looked like from space. Uh, here we are in St Andrews um, on top of where I'm currently sitting in the Butte building and indeed all other buildings in the university that have been about a kilometre of ice. Indeed, there was so much ice uh, drawn up into these huge ice sheets covering uh, northern Europe and North America that sea level was 120 metres lower due to all of that water being taken out and stored on land. So what was the CO2 concentration associated with an ice age? Well, to look at this, we can use these beautiful archives that we have of Earth's atmosphere in bubbles of air trapped in Antarctic ice. Now, this is really just an exquisite way to look at past atmospheres. These little bubbles, you know, that's just a perfect fossilized capsule of the atmosphere. This is the same air that our cavemen and cavewoman ancestors were breathing. And we can drill this whole, uh, this, this tube of ice on Antarctica, bring it up, crack open these bubbles in a vacuum and measure the composition of what's inside. So work by many paleoclimate scientists has uh, done that and put together this extraordinary compilation of CO2 data spanning the last 800,000 years. So these are thousands of years, so 800,000 years, 700, 600, et cetera, time going forward towards uh, the pre-industrial here. And what you can see is that there's this regular repeating pattern of CO2 change with low values of about 180 ppm, typifying an ice age, rising to higher values of around 280 ppm in interglacial periods. And one of my group's main research goals is looking at the mechanisms for uh, these kind of glacial interglacial changes in CO2. But now we're going to look at what's happened since the end of uh, the last ice age and plot on the CO2 change over the last couple of hundred years. And you can see that while these kind of, you know, th this, this previous rise in CO2 associated with the end of the last ice age, you know, this looks dramatic on kind of a geological time scale. It's about 100 ppm in 10,000 years, and it is associated with the melting back of all that ice from North America and Northern Europe and a rise in sea level of around 120 meters. 
Um, but this is, you know, relatively slow compared to um, to what we've done over the last hundred years, where you know we've done more than the same again now in terms of CO two rise, and we've done it a hundred times quicker, and we're only just starting to see the impacts of that CO two change. So if we want to work out what a world with 416 parts per million CO2 looks like, we're going to find, you know, we're going to find out lots of interesting things about climate from the ice ages, but we're not going to find a useful analogue for a high CO2 world. And so to try and find a 416 ppm world, we're going to have to wind the clock back further still and use a different paleoclimate archive. And so next we're going to turn to these tubes of mud. These are special tubes of mud. They're taken from uh, the floor of the deep ocean, so way offshore in the Atlantic and Pacific. Um, this, is, this is roughly what they, what they look like when you take a sample of them. This is uh, a bit of mud from uh, about four kilometers deep in the Pacific Ocean. I sampled this on a cruise between Hawaii and Alaska a couple of years ago. And the amazing thing um, about, I mean, you know, this, this probably looks pretty uninspiring. It looks relatively um, uninspiring to me even. But a fascinating thing then happens when you take that mud and you, you very simply just wash it through a little sieve, right? So I'm going to use a, a really fine mesh sieve. I'm going to wash out all the clay particles. And what you're then left with is this, which again, uh, without a microscope, doesn't look particularly exciting. But you can see here this kind of what looks like kind of light colored sand. And when we pop that light coloured sand under a microscope, as I've done here, what it reveals is that each of those supposedly sand grains are the shells of tiny planktonic creatures. So these are uh, largely the shells of foraminifera. These are single celled uh, protists. It's like an amoeba with a shell, essentially. Uh, they grow abundantly in the ocean surface and indeed on the deep sea floor as well. And as they grow, they encapsulate an absolutely beautiful record of the environmental conditions in which they grow. You know, they're, they're taking the ingredients for their shells from the salt water around them. And so that shell chemistry records this kind of fingerprint of past environmental conditions. And it's looking at these paleo fingerprints of past climate change that is the work that is done by my research group. Uh, this is a picture of us, uh, kind of, this is, you know, clearly pre-COVID, the number of people in the lab and the lack of face masks. Um, but yeah, this is, we have these wonderful state-of-the-art labs down on uh, the North Hall, and um, uh, we, we have to wear, it's, kind of, it's super clean, this lab, we're wearing kind of forensic uh, suits and, um, and there's lots of kind of fancy air handling because, you know, what we're looking at are tiny, tiny shells and then we're looking at concentrations of elements in them that might only be kind of present at a few parts per million. So, so often we're looking, for instance, um, at the, uh, the boron composition. I am a boron moron, both boring and moronic, uh, but boron allows us to find out fascinating things about paleo CO2. The difficulty is that there might be, in one of my samples, about two nanograms of boron, whereas all of you guys probably washed your clothes that you're wearing in a washing machine with hundreds of grams of boron. Persil stands for perborate silicate. So there's a lot of boron in the environment, in the, in the kind of, you know, a, a, among people, uh, there's hardly any in our samples. So we, we work in these super clean conditions. And Metis just asked a question. Um, these particular samples were taken from a few kilometers deep in the Pacific from one of these uh, tubes of mud. And, and these, these samples, you know, the, the, the shells continually fall down onto the sea floor and pile up. And so by taking samples going down through these sediment cores in time, it's like going back through the pages of a book where you have the climate history of our planet written. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm a boron moron. Why, uh, why do we deal with boron? Well, boron for, for reasons that, um, that my if, if, if any of my undergrads are here, they'd be able to, uh, to wax lyrical on. Um, boron records paleoacidity. And 
acidity in seawater is closely tied to the amount of CO2. So CO2 is a weak acid. Um, you might know this because you think of, you know, uh, Coca-Cola or in Scotland, an iron brew rotting your teeth because it's got a lot of uh, CO2 in it. So CO2 forms acidic solutions. If we know the pH of water, we can place very close constraints on the amount of CO2 in that water. And this is what we're able to do with the boron isotope composition of these tiny fossil shells. And so here's an example of that in, uh, and I'm afraid time is now going from left to right. So this is the modern day going back 250,000 years. In the black is that ice core record again. Um, so showing this kind of you know, beautiful record of CO2 from, from the ice cores. And then in the red circles, I'm showing CO2 as reconstructed using the boron isotope composition of fossil foraminifera. And you can see that we're able to reproduce that ice core record uh, with a precision of around 20 ppm. So with that established, we're now going back through geological time to reconstruct the long history of atmospheric CO2. And this in part is work done um, by, uh, by my group on RERC projects. Um, there's a, a few kind of fascinating twists and turns to how to do this going further back in time. Um, one of them involves looking at samples like, like this one. This is a fossil salt crystal. And if you look really carefully, you might just be able to see this tiny moving bubble in this crystal. This bubble is a, is a bubble of air inside a, a, a fluid inclusion. This is uh, an inclusion of ancient seawater. And so we're drilling into these inclusions using a laser system to analyze the composition of ancient seawater. We compare that with the boron isotope composition of these shells to produce this long record of atmospheric CO2. Okay, so let's look at the results of that. And this is work that came out in a paper we published last year. So I'm showing atmospheric CO2 on, uh, on the bottom. I'm using uh, a log two scale because CO2 has a logarithmic impact on climate. And I'm showing a reconstruction of temperature over this interval on the top panel. The time scale here goes from uh, the modern day on the right back to um, 66 million years ago. And this is a, a kind of useful time scale to, to look at. And for, for one reason is we've got lots of those nice sediment core records. Um, secondly, this is a world that looks you know, not too dissimilar in some respects to the modern. The, the position of most of the continent is kind of roughly similar to today. Um, India has yet to collide with Asia. There's a few other interesting differences, but, but you know, they're all kind of roughly in the same place. And also this is the point at which the dinosaurs uh, died out. And so we're kind of left with a more modern flora and fauna. So you can see that over this time period, which is called the Cenozoic, Climate has changed a lot, and the primary driver of that has been changes in CO2. You can see uh, a pretty close match between changes in CO2 and temperature. When CO2 changes, temperature changes inevitably follow. Um, I'm going to uh, let us kind of zoom in on uh, uh, some of the detail of this with this slightly different presentation. Um, so, so here I'm breaking up uh, that time scale. I'm showing uh, the really old bit, so kind of one to 60 million years um, in this panel here. This is that ice core record of CO2 going from 800 years back to um, pre-industrial. And then here is uh, kind of pre-industrial CO2. So to so orient us, um, great to be at a university. You can plot on a geological timescale. So here's the foundation of St. Andrews in 1413. Um, and you know, the, the dawn of here are the ice ages. Uh, this is the, the dawn of our, our genus um, uh, a couple of million years ago um, and the demise of the dinosaurs way back here. So CO2 has clearly changed before. Um, and some people will kind of use this as an argument of oh, CO2 has changed before. What have we got to worry about uh, just now? 
But I think the first lesson that we should take from these paleo CO2 records is that when CO2 changes, it transforms Earth climate, Earth's climate in ways that are completely unimaginable to us and our modern civilization. Um, and James asks uh, a great question that often comes up. How do we know that it's um, CO2 impacting temperature rather than the other way around? And, and the, the kind of quick answer is that um, just mechanistically, um, we, we have a really good understanding of the ways in which CO2 changes temperature. We've known about that, actually. It was um, an amateur female scientist, Eunice newton Foote, who in the mid-1800s uh, made the first experiment showing the heat-trapping properties of CO2. And Sponti Arrhenius had worked out kind of most of the ins and outs of that process by 1896. So we've, we've had for a long time this really detailed understanding of how CO2 impacts temperature. Flipping that the other way around, um, there just aren't that many ways in which temperature influences CO2. It, it can have a, it can have a, a kind of a small influence. Um, if temperature rises a, a little bit, you can bring a little bit more CO2 out of the ocean and into the atmosphere. Uh, but those changes are pretty minor, for one. And then secondly, we'd be left with what drove that temperature change over, um, you know, over that long, uh, over that long time scale. Um, so we we have a good understanding of the fact that CO2 can change temperature. You know, absent this being caused by CO2, we that we'd have you know really very little idea why would temperature show that long change in, um, in, 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 in climate. And indeed, these were insights that Eunice Newton and Arrhenius had way back in the 1800s. They said, you know, based on fossil evidence, we know that there have been worlds in the past which have been colder and warmer, and the best explanation for those is likely um, uh, higher or lower CO2. And that remains the best explanation. Um, of course, this then moves the question again to what changed CO2 um, and on these long time scales it's tiny tiny very slow imbalances between the amount of CO2 that comes out of volcanoes and the amount of CO2 reacting with rocks at Earth's surface. Okay so I mentioned that uh, Eunice newton Foote and Arrhenius had um, you know talked about the fossil evidence for what um, for, for what CO2 might do in Earth's past. And I'm gonna highlight a couple, of, um, a couple of examples of that uh, just now. The first is from the Eocene. So this is a time of kind of peak warmth about 50 million years ago. At this time, we can find the skeletons, the fossil skeletons of alligators and crocodiles in, um, in the high Arctic. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's it, these are cold-blooded creatures. They do not survive um, if temperatures get below freezing. Uh, so this gives uh, an indication of, of really a completely different climate uh, back in the Eocene. Um, secondly, um, let's look at something that is more analogous to modern. So I've been saying that we want to find that climate with 416 ppm of CO2, like we have today, what would that look like? And to find that, we need to go back to the mid Pliocene warm period. It's 3 million years ago. Um, it's the last time that CO2 was above 400 ppm. And it's a time where you have um, fossilized beech trees growing on the Antarctic peninsula. And so, again, a, a really different climate um, uh, and one with uh, a nice enough ice melted back that this is uh, what we think Antarctica looked like. So the grey shows you uh, the kind of diminished extent of uh, the Antarctic ice sheets with large portions of um, this part of Antarctica ice free. Um, again, a much diminished ice sheet on Greenland. And as a result, um, it's thought the sea level was at least five, but maybe up to 25 meters higher than it is today. So this tells us where we are headed. When Earth's climate equilibrates, when it catches up with a CO2 level, of five to 25, uh, oh, sorry, of 416 ppm. Um, you know, th this is the equilibrium state. It, it's huge amounts of 
ice melt and substantially higher sea level. Now, thankfully, it takes large ice sheets some time to melt, to kind of to catch up. It takes temperature some time to catch up because you've got to heat up, for instance, all of the, the water in the ocean, and that's a, a big cold thermal mass. It then takes ice uh, some time uh, to, to catch up and, and, and melt to equilibrate with that higher CO2 level as well. But exactly how long it takes is a pretty open and active area of research. Indeed, it's something being really actively worked on uh, by the glaciology group in geography here. And so uh, this, this figure from the IPCC gives some indication of that, that, um, that our committed sea level rise of CO2 is allowed to stay around 413 ppm, and we get up to temperatures of around three, three and a half degrees C. After a couple of thousand years, maybe five to 10 meters sea level rise, and after 10,000 years, maybe up to 25 meters sea level rise. Um, and and you know, there, there are, a number of indications that, um, that, that ice sheets are moving somewhat faster uh, than we, we thought they might, um, certainly uh, when we modeled Ford a decade ago. So, so this is the kind of long-term view of where we have come from and where we are headed if we allow Earth's climate to catch up with a CO2 level of 416 ppm. But I'll also point out that you know, even the changes that we're seeing already uh, to our climate system uh, are pretty pronounced and uh, something that we have to seriously reckon with. So to look at this more recent record of uh, paleo climate, paleo temperature changes, one of the key archives we're going to turn to uh, is that uh, encoded by uh, by fossilized wood by, by tree rings. And I just wanted to briefly highlight that this is work um, that kind of internationally, uh, we have one of the real kind of leaders in here in earth and environmental sciences at St. Andrews. This is Rob Wilson, and he's delivering his inaugural professorial lecture tomorrow evening at 5.15 in school three. Um, and I would really encourage anyone to, uh, to come along and uh, attend. Rob will talk about the kind of his, his career reconstructing climate uh, from uh, tree rings and some of the twists and turns along the way. So those records from, uh, from tree rings and other paleo archives such as corals have been used to extend the instrumental record of temperatures, which only extends, you know, our instrumental records only ex extend 150 years or so. But beyond that, we can use tree rings to get a record over at least a couple of thousand years. And that's shown here again from an IPCC figure pointing out uh, that uh, the warming that we've already seen is unprecedented um, in more than 2000 years or, or probably even uh, much longer than that. And this also, of course, makes the point um, that uh, this warming is, uh, you know, it's CO2, it's, it's human CO2 driven. Uh, when you run climate models and you don't include CO2 and you just include the natural forcings, which are kind of tiny oscillations in solar output and the occasional volcanic eruption. Again, uh, work being done here by Andrea Burt, Will Hutchison and Rob looking at the climatic impact of these uh, big eruptions. You know, there's, there's interesting changes in here, but no long term secular trend. It's only by adding in uh, those kind of human factors and CO2 chief among them that we are able to reconstruct the observed temperature change in our climate models. Um, great question from, from Meta. What would paleo records look like for different, um, for, for different greenhouse gases? Uh, they look <clears throat> uh, similar or even slightly more dramatic if we look at um, methane and N2O. Um, uh, slightly more dramatic in that those greenhouse gases have shorter lifetimes, so it's, it's harder to keep them in the atmosphere by natural processes alone. Um, the fact that they have shorter lifetimes is also the reason that you know, most climate change science is focused on CO2, because it's the one that if it goes in the atmosphere, it tends to stay there and drive climate change for a long time. Okay, so 
I've just shown you this uh, this history of you know recent climate change in a kind of uh, globally averaged sense, um, but there is of course a bunch of interesting spatial structure to this too. I'm showing that here with these maps of temperature anomaly from NASA. Uh, I started the clock uh, back in um, uh, the start of the 20th century. We're showing here um, temperature anomalies uh, relative to the latter half of the 20th century. And so this is the, the pattern uh, that emerges. Most of the world is uh, warming dramatically. There is even more warming on uh, continents for reasons that, uh, that might burn here in Earth sciences um, is, is you know, kind, of, kind of pioneering the scientific understanding of. But I want to talk briefly to you today uh, about a region that isn't warming. And of course, Sod's Law, it's just off the coast of Scotland. So um, this is the so-called warming hole in the North Atlantic. It's, it's a robust observational feature and it's linked in part. There are, there are a couple of different ideas uh, about its cause, but one of the leading hypotheses for these is um, that it's linked to a change in ocean circulation. And this again is something um, where we find useful information drawn from paleoclimate. So ocean circulation um, is something we should be kind of you know, really thankful for here in Scotland. Um, the, the warm waters of uh, the Gulf Stream basically absorb uh, solar energy in the tropics where you've got lots of sunlight um, and the Gulf Stream brings that north uh, to, to the coast of Scotland. Now, uh, that heat then gets released to the atmosphere, allowing that water to cool and because it's quite salty it gets very dense so it gets cold salty so it gets dense it sinks to the bottom of the ocean and it flows back southward as this enormous deep ocean current and we describe this circulation as a conveyor belt type circulation where that sinking and southward flow in part helps pull that warm water from the tropics north and you can see the impact of that. Um, I mean, you, you, you have, there's some good kind of points of reference for this. If we compare the climate of Scotland to kind of cities on uh, similar latitudes, you know, it would be kind of uh, southern Alaskan cities are, are pretty frigid um, or kind of St. Petersburg is again on uh, a comparable latitude. We are in northwest Europe warmed substantially by uh, these warm currents flowing north. And that's what this uh, figure shows here. It shows the, uh, the temperature anomaly for any given uh, longitudinal region compared to the, the average of other, um, other places on the same latitude. So this keeps us warm today, but based on paleo data, we know that it can change pretty suddenly. And one of the most dramatic uh, indicators of that it comes from these. This is um, a layer of uh, quartz grains um, that disrupts the typical pattern of sedimentation in our deep sea sediment cores. Uh, you can see, you know, most deep sea mud is, you know, it's kind of fine grained. Um, so you're washing in clay and from the continents and clay is so fine, it can travel a long distance, um, suspended in water and be deposited in the deep ocean. Stuff that's the size of sand, you know, that sinks pretty quickly, pretty directly. And so sand from rivers um, gets trapped on the continental shelves and it never makes it into the open ocean. Typically, sand-sized stuff, well, it, it really has to have come from directly above you. And so typically, it's these shells that are grown in the water directly above a given deep sea core. But every now and again, during the last ice age, we find these layers of sand and gravel right out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And essentially, the only way that you can move this big kind of heavy material right into uh, the middle of the Atlantic Ocean is by rafting it in on icebergs. So this is called ice rafted detritus. And we find records of ice rafting uh, extending in kind of rapid, discrete events, extending all the way south to the coast of, uh, of 
you know, France and down even as far as the Iberian Peninsula, down as far as uh, Bermuda uh, in the Western Atlantic. And this indicates um, a dramatic change in ocean circulation with uh, a kind of a pronounced weakening of this current system, allowing um, much colder conditions in the surface ocean and, and the spread of these icebergs southwards within the Atlantic. So the ILD gives us a useful qualitative indicator of that. We can also reconstruct quantitative changes in temperature during these events from Greenland ice cores. So I'm showing a record uh, from that here. Here's uh, the ice core again. Again, you can look at layers within this. They're recorded each year, so you can read back through that like the pages of a book. And we're measuring here the isotopic composition of oxygen. This is a useful uh, proxy for uh, the temperature over Greenland. And these ice cores were drilled in the early 90s and they revealed a picture of climate change that was completely unexpected. In fact, it was so completely unexpected that it was only really a kind of geopolitical um, kind of difficulty that made us trust them so much. And this was the fact that the Europeans at the time had um, all the ice core expertise really. So uh, in particular in Denmark and Switzerland um, had you know, kind of great ice core scientists. Um, there were a bunch of uh, good American ice core scientists too, but, but um, they, you know, they had some of the equipment that the Europeans would need, but not all of the expertise. So the Europeans wanted to be the people to take the first ice core. Um, the Americans wanted to be the people to take the first ice core too, because they said, you, know, you need our Hercules planes to take the ice out. Um, they couldn't agree who was gonna get to do it first. So they agreed, in fact, to drill two ice cores um, about 50 kilometers apart, which in the end was just as well. One, it was more material and two, they revealed an exact replica of this completely, at the time, unexpected pattern of very rapid climate change events. And when I say very rapid, these are changes of uh, plus or minus 10 degrees C in less than 10 years. So, so an, an incredible abrupt switch in the climate um, of, uh, of Greenland and indeed around uh, Northern Europe. But actually this, change in climate extends globally. And, and this is, um, this forms part of our kind of you know, next lesson, which is about the rapidity and also interconnectedness of climate change. And so we can see that global signature in part through archives that come from these. These are stalagmites taken from uh, cave systems around the world. Again, in these layers, they recall a really exquisite um, highly resolved record of past climate change events. And here are some data from, um, from a, an East Asian um, uh, stalagmite and that temperature record <clears throat> from Greenland for a period of uh, the last ice age going from 60,000 to 30,000 years ago. And so you can see associated with each of these uh, abrupt events in Greenland, we also see a corresponding abrupt event in monsoonal rainfall, which is what uh, we're recording in the records from uh, these speleothems, suggesting that you know, a cooling of climate causes a, a pronounced uh, shift and weakening of the East Asian monsoon. So this is our next lesson from paleoclimate. That climate change can be fast, <coughs> interconnected, and unexpected. If you had been a cave person living in uh, Scotland at the time, uh, you would have no way of knowing that the overturning circulation was about to collapse, giving this huge flux of icebergs into the North Atlantic. Um, and indeed, uh, if you'd been in, um, in you know, living in China at that time, you'd be pretty taken aback by a very abrupt change in the monsoon system. Now, changes in the overturning circulation are predicted as we warm the planet because they rely, that system of currents relies on water getting cold and dense, allowing it to sink. And so as you warm water up and as you put meltwater into the North Atlantic, uh, you make it more buoyant, you disrupt that sinking process. I should, however, say 
that we don't predict a complete collapse of the type that may have happened in the last ice age. And we don't predict as pronounced a change <coughs> in temperature to come from this uh, for, for a couple of reasons related to the kind of differences in uh, the kind of overall climate conditions of the ice age compared to just now. And we don't also expect something quite as dramatic as the depiction of this process in the day after tomorrow. It's a great disaster film made about collapse of the overturning circulation. In the day after tomorrow, you have scientists running away from kind of you know, freezing corridors, there's you know, ice kind of running along the corridor after, after um, paleoceanographers. Uh, that's not gonna happen, but it does speak, this process does speak to um, you know, the fact that, that climate can change in kind of complex interconnected ways and in ways that are not always uh, expectable or predicted. Okay, so now back to um, CO2, what happens when CO2 rises rapidly and what can we learn um, about solutions perhaps going forward? So there have been events when CO2 has risen rapidly in the past, typically associated with massive episodes of volcanism. One of these is um, the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, it's the spike here of temperature and CO2, um, associated with the, the splitting, the, the start of the opening of uh, the North Atlantic. Um, uh, and Meta, just briefly, while we're on the previous topic, asks, is it hard to compare samples from regions <clears throat> as far apart and different as Greenland and Malaysia and from such different kinds of samples? Um, so um, so you know, we're not trying to, I guess, we're, you know, they're, they're telling us about different things, right? So uh, the Greenland ice core is telling us largely about temperatures over Greenland. Um, the oxygen isotopes from these, um, these Asian cave systems are telling us about rainfall in those systems. Um, but it's, I guess, you know, when you, when you plot them together, as we're doing here, you see that there's this series of um, kind of, you know, events mirrored in both of those records. Um, you, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a set of changes that would be, you know, it's very hard to um, think of ways where both of those could be happening with no uh, connection to one another. Um, uh, in particular, when you also, I'm showing two examples here, but you see changes in rainfall in all of the major rainfall belts around the world. Furthermore, we can see this as a kind of predicted physical response in climate models, that when you cool the North Atlantic rapidly, um, you change atmospheric temperature gradients, and it's those temperature gradients that steer our rainfall systems. So, um, uh, so, so this is, um, it, it's a, it, it's, I hope, I hope that answers the question. You know, it, it's, um, uh, you know, we, we wouldn't have necessarily can, you know, known about these changes before creating data like this, but now that we've done that, you can see this interconnected global pattern of temperature change. Okay, so the PTM is associated not just with warming, but also with ocean acidification. So this is sometimes referred to as the other CO2 problem. I briefly touched on it earlier that CO2 makes acidic solutions. And so um, that, uh, that extra, and that extra H plus, that acidity, um, unfortunately has uh, a, a kind of um, a, a, an impact on um, marine life, such as our wee shells here, um, and many indeed of the shells that you can think of, um, you know, oyster shells, corals, which are made out of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate becomes more soluble in more acidic waters, uh, so it can either dissolve or at least it's a lot harder to grow. And you can see a record of that in uh, these cores here. This is the deep sea expression of the PETM. Uh, the, the white shells from the sediment core just suddenly disappear because they're all dissolved away, leaving only red clay behind. Um, and this is, uh, this is bad news for, uh, for marine life. And we've been looking at this um, from uh, a couple of different perspectives um, in, in our group and indeed in the group of uh, Nikki Allison here at St Andrews grows corals under different CO2 concentrations to look at the impact of changing acidity on marine life. 
One tack that we've been taking is looking um, deeper into uh, the geological record. This was work um, begun by uh, a BSc student, Mikey van Murek, my group, and uh, then taken on by my current PhD student, Molly Trunko, um, who looked at fossil oyster shells from the uh, South Wales Riviera, shown here, glamorous field day in South Wales. And Mikey um, dug these beautifully preserved oyster shells out of these ancient rocks to look at what happens during the Triassic, uh, Jurassic boundary event. It's one of the big extinction events in Earth's history. And lots of people had uh, previously hypothesized that this may be associated with ocean acidification. There's a huge volcanic eruption uh, around this time. Uh, there are a bunch of records of warming and CO2 input, but there was no reconstruction previously of a change in acidity. And so in brief, here are the data that Mikey uh, started and uh, Molly has now been leading up. These are now uh, currently under review, um, where we see from the chemical fingerprints of those fossil shells, a signal indeed of warming of CO2 inputs and also acidification at this time. So our third lesson is that CO2 can drive acidification and that this um, has often in the geological record been associated with extinction. I'm showing extinction rates in uh, over the last 300 million years in these gray symbols and uh, pH changes, negative pH changes in uh, these red diamonds. And uh, the work of our group and others is looking at each of these extinctions to see um, the extent of, um, uh, of pH change at these times. And this is a worry, of course, because as we rise uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, it dissolves in seawater, making that water more acidic. So this brings us to our final lesson uh, from Earth's past, which is quite simply that we must reduce CO2 in the atmosphere. And paleoclimate provides some ideas for how to do this. So let's return to this PETM ocean acidification event. You can see that CO2 has reacted with calcium carbonate shells. But in the process, that um, reaction in part neutralizes that CO2, taking it essentially out of the atmosphere and, uh, and, and neutralizing uh, the global warming that would have been associated with it. And indeed, the Earth system has a variety of different ways by which CO2 is taken up from the atmosphere. I'm showing these on, uh, on a figure here. So um, this figure shows uh, a release of CO2, a, a rapid release of CO2 by burning of fossil fuels. And then it shows what happens to that CO2 um, over the next uh, couple of tens of thousands of years. So on relatively quick timescales, CO2 gets taken up by the terrestrial biosphere and by the ocean following these reactions here. Then on timescales of about a thousand years, uh, that more acidic water in the ocean starts to dissolve <clears throat> deep sea shells. Um, so taking up CO2 by this reaction here, like we just looked at. And then finally, on timescales of hundreds of thousands of years, CO2 reacts with the abundant silicate rocks at Earth's surface, um, which ultimately kind of forms the, the, the backstop of CO2 change. And, and this is indeed partly Earth's long-term thermostat. So the planet has mechanisms of taking CO2 back out of the atmosphere, but left to their own devices, these are really slow. And so the question is, can we speed up any of these processes to try and capture CO2 out of the atmosphere today? So I'm going to just briefly talk about three of these ideas. The first is one that myself, Paul Webb in chemistry and Andrea Burke, also in the sciences, are working on, which is the idea that we might uh, accelerate that uh, dissolution of limestone. So um, rather than putting CO2 into the atmosphere and then into seawater, acidifying the whole ocean and then dissolving the shells on the sea floor, the idea here is that you could kind of short circuit this process. You could essentially mine 
long dead limestone, crush it up, put it in a, a big tank of water and bubble CO2 from point sources of CO2, such as power stations, through uh, that mixture, driving this reaction much more quickly um, and leaving you with calcium ions and bicarbonate ions. And this is something that, uh, that we hope to, uh, to do some kind of test work on with the biomass plant at Garnbridge. The second idea is, of course, that we should plant <clears throat> more trees. And this is just, you know, that this is in, in a way a no-brainer. We, we absolutely should. It's great to see the work done in the St Andrews Forest that aims uh, to do this. Um, we should also critically protect old trees. You know, stop chopping them down is, um, is you know, kind of should be really cheaper and easier uh, than planting new ones. So uh, this is... A great thing to do, I should say that this, along with all these other mechanisms, um, is not a, a panacea. We can't plant our way out of the CO2 crisis, but, but we can uh, ameliorate it by, uh, by planting and protecting uh, the terrestrial biosphere. Finally, the idea that we might um, do enhanced silicate weathering. <clears throat> this is something that's gained some traction in uh, the last five years or so. The idea that we can put the most weatherable rocks which you find quite abundantly actually in uh, some kinds of mine waste. The idea we can take those and put them into the environments uh, where they weather the most quickly, which are, which are warm, wet, tropical environments with lots of CO2. Uh, and it turns out that the kind of plant root environment in tropical soils and fields um, is potentially um, a, a good way to get this reaction to go faster. So CO2 removal, is possible and it will ultimately have to happen because a CO2 level of 416 ppm in the atmosphere today um, is already too high. Um, we, we cannot equilibrate with 416 ppm of CO2. Otherwise, you know, we, we end up with that, you know, 10, maybe even 20 meters of sea level rise, which is, of course, all of our coastal cities. <clears throat> but I should mention, again, none of these are, are panaceas. Uh, they're in the early stages of development, um, and they will take a, a lot of further research and effort to enact. The low-hanging fruit is, of course, not putting CO2 into the atmosphere in the first place and replacing current CO2 sources with clean energy. Uh, and so it's really exciting to see uh, the initiatives of things like the Centre for Energy Ethics and the N Cafe here uh, are talking about the ways in which that might happen. Okay, so I'll just quickly summarize. Uh, we looked at the way that CO2 can transform Earth's climate and the geological evidence for that. We've seen that uh, major CO2 per input causes extinctions. We've seen that climate change can be fast, interconnected, and unexpected, <clears throat> and we must decrease CO2. And we know how to do this, but we need to do it uh, and do it as quickly as possible. This is something I think about a lot, both as a climate scientist, uh, but also as a dad. The future is uncertain, but we're sending our kids there. Thank you very much.